And we're live. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jessica with Bat B and B. Thank you for joining our chat with Merlin Tuttle today. We're gonna talk everything bat houses and Merlin's new bat house guide. So let me get Merlin and Teresa on here. Let's see. Thanks for joining as you hop on. Let us know where you're watching from. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Jessica. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Well, we're, if I look a little scruffy today, we're in the middle of a horrible ice storm. We haven't had, oh, no. we haven't had power in our homes for almost two days days now temperature when i left home was in the mid 40s uh ice has mm -hmm. knocked down trees so i was lucky to get the car out and uh, uh so we're kind of taking refuge down at the office because that happens to be one of the few places where there's still power in town oh well i'm glad you have somewhere to go <laughs> well okay. it never bothers me to go to the office because that's where I pretty much hang out anyway. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. I know you're always busy with something, Marilyn. I'm so glad you took some time to join us today. <laughs> um, Merlin, I wanted to talk a lot about, obviously, we're about B&B, and you have your new bat house guide out, so I wanted to talk a lot about bat houses. Does that sound good with you? That's just fine. Perfect. Um, can you tell us like your history with bat houses? I know you said in the book that it's going on 40 years since you've introduced them here. Give us your history of it. Well, I didn't build the first bat house in America. The first bat house in America was huge done mm -hmm. in San Antonio in the interest of controlling malaria. But uh, in terms of using bat houses that the public could actually build and have in their yards. Uh, I was first introduced those back in about the, or the early 1980s. And at that time, nearly everybody in America thought that most bats were rabid and going to attack. Uh, the last thing in the world they wanted was to attract bats to a yard. But we've made a heck of a lot of progress since then and educating people to the value of sharing our yards with bats. And so today there are literally, I'll bet there are more than 100,000 bat houses up with uh, probably more than a million bats living in artificial roofs in people's backyards, even on university campuses. How have you seen things change with bat houses over the years? What has changed about them? About the bad houses or the people's? I guess both. Those are both great questions. <laughs> well, we know we're making a lot of progress in shedding the truth on bats because before I introduced bat houses, nearly everybody wanted to get rid of them. Americans were spending literally millions of dollars a year uh, paying pest control companies to kill bats. And in mm -hmm. fact, the first, my first action when I decided to devote full time to conserving bats was to get poisoning bats prohibited. In fact, it's now prohibited in the United States. Uh, why prohibited? Because the poisons they're putting in people's homes to supposedly protect them from bats were actually extremely dangerous poisons. Uh, methyl bromide, for example, is probably more dangerous even than cyanide. They would, a company would come and put a $5 canister of it in your home. You'd have to vacate for three days while they fumigate. But the bats were living up in the attic and the, and the poison was heavier than air. So it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do, thank goodness. And when the people would come back, they would sometimes call me. I had, I was curator of mammals at the Milwaukee Public Museum then. 
and mm -hmm. they'd say, you know, we're home and the house stinks and the bats are still in the attic. And I'd say, well, if the house stinks, you better get out of there in a big hurry because methyl bromide can fry your brain permanently. Uh, wow. It's a very, very bad thing to be inhaling. But uh, we gradually went from that to nowadays museums and zoos, places that get calls from the public, uh, report that the majority of their calls are about how can I track bats to live in my yard. That's, a, of course, a huge uh, change and improvement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's that's great. And then how have bat houses themselves changed? Well, when we started out, we didn't know a whole lot about what it took to get bats in a bat house, but we've learned trial and error. It's helped greatly that early on, I encouraged thousands of people who built and put up bat houses to report the results, exactly the dimensions of the house, how much sun exposure it got, what the climate was, where it was located, uh, what kind of roosting partitions it had. And as people reported their successes and failures, I was able to sort out what bats really needed and wanted. And uh, we've learned a heck of a lot about bat preferences over these years. Uh, you might, your audience might be questioning why need bat houses in the first place. Uh, they're for more than just entertaining people, and they do entertain. Uh, I've gotten so many calls from people that have, you know, even a dozen bats in a bat house can be very fascinating to watch them come out in the evening. But uh, sometimes people have hundred, hundreds, and some of the most successful bat house users in America have tens of thousands of the bats they've attracted. And uh, that's, of course, real good uh, for bats because one of the main reasons we're building bat houses is that the bats have lost nearly the vast majority of their original roost. They mm -hmm. lived most of the ones that you'd find in your yard uh, lived in old snags. And the last thing we tolerate now is old snags. We want to get them down as a safety hazard. And uh, so the bats also lived in uh, cavities in ancient tree hollows, but we've harvested those and we've planted young trees we, we take pride in planting new trees, but those new trees won't harbor bats for most of them probably more than 100 years. So bats are, many of them destitute, very much in need of new homes. And by putting up bat houses, we can help them survive. Absolutely. Well, Merlin, I'm located in Maine, and the bats that we see using bat houses the most here are the big browns. What species do you see using bat houses the most in Texas? In Texas, it would be the Mexican or the Brazilian free-tailed bat. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we fairly frequently have evening bats or cave myotis bats that uh, move into bat houses. I might say that the ones you have, the big brown bats, this is a kind of a story on how much we still need to learn about bats. For decades, throughout most of my career, we've thought that, that big brown bats ate mostly beetles, and that's because it's easy to see beetle parts in their droppings, but you don't see mosquito parts in their droppings. They get too well digested. Since genetic typing, we call barcoding, has come in vogue, it's been amazing how many mosquitoes we find these bats eat. The big brown bat, for example, that we didn't think hardly ever ate mosquitoes. It turns mm -hmm. out that they're a major part of the bat's diet. And uh, in a recent study in Wisconsin, it was found that they were eating 
bats from bat houses in people's yards were consuming 15 species of mosquitoes, including nine that carry West Nile virus. Gosh, that's great. Um, well, as you're talking about the mosquitoes that they might eat, can you tell us more the broad spectrum, how bats help with insect control? Well, they do a lot. Of bats. bats do a lot more than just eating insects. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a study done in Europe about a close relative of our big brown bats in which they calculate that single bat was catching as many as a thousand mosquitoes in one hour. But they do a lot more than that. They also scare a lot of other insects that have developed special hearing to listen for bats. And when these insects, a lot of the moths that are pests in your yard and garden, uh, cutworm moths, armyworm moths, uh, they're listening for bad echolocation. And it's been shown recently that uh, just by having the bats calls hearable in a yard, you scare away a lot of insects that could be a pest mm. otherwise. If they hear the bat sound and leave the area, they don't want to get caught. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't know that. And they also eat a lot of agricultural pests, is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, there are lots of studies coming out now that we're finally looking at those kind of things a little belatedly. Our bats have, are now the most endangered animals in North America and probably worldwide. They're very vulnerable. People misunderstand them and kill them and they hear about COVID and Ebola and a lot of very exaggerated tales about where these diseases might have come from when in fact there's no evidence to support coming from bats. Uh, because of all this bad publicity, you especially need to know the benefits of having bats around. Uh, first of all, to finish that thought, I have personally captured, handled, photographed tens of thousands of bats worldwide for 60 years. I've never seen an aggressive bat, never been attacked, never been bitten except in self-defense, and never contracted disease from a bat. Like veterinarians, we who study bats are vaccinated against rabies just because we're handling unfamiliar animals that occasionally get bitten. We don't want to worry about what would happen. But for anybody that just doesn't try to handle bats, there's absolutely nothing to worry about. Now to get back to uh, <clears throat> scaring insects out of your yard, a study just recently was actually looking at forest protection. Bats have a major role in protecting native forests from rainforest to temperate forests, even in places like Indiana. And this recent study in Indiana showed that there was 500% less insect damage to tree seedlings mm -hmm. where there were bats, as opposed to areas where you put up exposures so that bats couldn't enter the area. And what are you doing currently with bat houses? Are you working with some pecan farmers in bat houses? Yes, we are. Uh, we're testing groups of bat houses uh, to see exactly what the bats' preferences are. Uh, interestingly, the first two kinds of bat houses we decide to test are the uh, two that we most prominently recommend in my new, new bat house guide mm -hmm. right there. And uh, those those two houses have done so well when tested in pecan orchards that we're not sure which one the bats prefer. We know that they this summer moved into both kinds in a period in which the temperatures, 
the daytime highs were 102 to 107 every day. So obviously they're okay in heat. And then we found that as things cooled off toward the fall, that the same bats appeared to show a preference for uh, nearby houses of the other kind that uh, were probably kept them a little warmer when it was cold outside. So mm -hmm. that probably explains why people who put up two or more bad houses within an area, it doesn't have to be right side by side, but within say a hundred yards or so of each other, they have twice the odds of success probably because the bats are accustomed to when they live in the snags those snags often fall down during storms and they need a new home real quick so they need to know where their next possible home is going to be if they lose their current one and uh, so we recommend putting up a couple bad houses and it's not a bad idea to have one where it gets a lot of a lot more sun than another one or one that's darker in color than the other one so that they're providing different temperature uh, I know of a case in Arkansas where a guy put up a bad house under the shade of a tree and uh, he called me and complained that he did his bad house just the way I instructed, but uh, in several years, he hadn't gotten any bats. And I said, well, you know, from the sounds of it, the house is too shaded, not getting warm enough for bats to warm or young there. So he uh, uh, put one up in a sunny location, and right away he got a nursery colony of big brown bats. And they used that house every year for like 10 years and never used the shaded house. We would have thought from that that the only houses you should put up in that area would have been the full sun houses. Mm -hmm. But then a really hot summer came along where the heat was a big threat and that year his colony survived by moving to the shaded house. So he, even houses that may seem to be in the wrong place may during extremes of temperature prefer the, the, the place that seems initially to be wrong. Yeah, that actually brings up, I have a list of some questions that we had submitted to us for people that wanted me to ask you special questions about bat houses. And that actually came up a lot was the risk of the bats overheating. And you kind of just said having a, an option for a shadier spot will encourage them to move to a new location. Can you repeat that? Yeah, we got a lot of questions wondering about the risk of the bats overheating in warmer climates. And you kind of mentioned that they may, if you have an option of a bat house in the shade, they're going to move to a different location. Well, the best, the ideal is to provide, when you're starting out, especially when you're starting out new in an area, the best, most success is achieved by putting houses some in full sun, some shade, some, you know, experiment. Uh, in our pecan orchard houses last summer, we used two different kinds and we just lucked out that both of them were very attractive to the bats. But um, uh, a lot of the most successful bat house users in America were failures when they started. Uh, a person in Wisconsin, uh, put his first bat houses up in his yard. He didn't get any bats in three years, but then he decided to try to put some up. He realized that the, as time went on, we learned more about where bat houses should be located to be successful. And he realized that he was quite a ways from good feeding grounds, uh, often associated with rivers. And so he went to a state park, not 
of far away and offered to put up some bat houses near a river in the state park. And he was immediately big time successful. He uh, expanded from there and now he monitors houses with thousands of bats in two different state parks and uses the opportunity. He worked with the parks to put up a sign in each location explaining to people about the values of bats and and the campers love to come watch the bats come out in the evening and it's a great educational opportunity to help bats. Yeah, thank you for that. Do you mind if I ask you some of the other questions that were submitted by followers? Sure. A lot of what we hear about, and I know you and I have talked about this before, Merlin, and you mentioned this in your book, too. So if you want to keep it short, that's okay, and encourage people to read the Bat House Guide. But should people be worried about bat guano with bat houses up? There's nothing more to be worried about bat guano than there is about bird guano. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know of anybody that's very, that's very frightened about... Uh, bird droppings. Uh, this, there is a fungus that uh, causes a, a lung ailment disease called histoplasmosis. You can get it from either bird droppings or bat droppings. But most people have already been exposed. Something like 90 some percent of people living east of the Mississippi have already been exposed. It, for most people, it's a very mild uh, problem when they get it it's not even diagnosed because it's passed off as a cold mm -hmm. uh it's it's not much of a problem except if you go into a place where you have a lot of bad or bird droppings and you stir up a lot of dust and breathe it carelessly uh but seriously it's if you're not worried about having bird houses in your yard you know then don't worry about having bad houses. Absolutely. Uh, Merlin, what are your thoughts on adding a pup catcher under bat houses? Excuse me, I was interrupted. What, what are your thoughts on adding a pup catcher under bat houses? Is that necessary? No. Uh, I have asked some of the best bat house users in America their opinions and they don't think they, 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 they look at them as mostly a gimmick that some producers of bad houses sell as an extra add on that they can sell. Yeah. Uh, you might occasionally catch a falling pup, but pups, the, if, if you've got a good bad house in the first place, very few pups should be falling out of it. <clears throat> and what, really is more likely to happen if your house is in a place where it gets a lot of sun and then you have an extreme heat event where the temperature goes very high the mothers can leave but if the pups are too old they can't be carried off to a new location and they they can some of them then be left behind and die of the heat uh, also, if you have a very bad year when there's a drought and there's very few insects to eat and the mother uh, can't find enough to care for both her and her pup, she may abandon the pup or she may just get caught by an owl or something and not come back. Well, those pups will fall out of the house, but putting them back in or catching them in a bat catcher is not going to make much difference to their survival. That makes a lot of sense. What about this? Another question that came in was wondering if people have bees that they take care of in their yard, is it okay to have bats in the yard as well? Bats in the yard with what again? With bees, bees, if people have beehives? Uh, bats don't eat bees, they're, they're smart enough. In a rare occasion when a bat catches a bee, animal rehabbers often get that bat with a very big swollen up lip. And uh, you know that they're not, they're 
they're not out there they're not overlapping much in in time of activity either uh there are bats pallid bats that can survive easily and don't even bother with the stings of scorpions and centipedes and they eat scorpions and centipedes i've seen a bat get stung 24 times in a row and not even wince but bees are different and you hear, you read in books that bees are among the things eaten by bats. The reason you hear that is that bees and ants, for example, are in the same order of insects. They're hymenopterans. And in the old studies, a scientist would look at the feces of a bat and he'd see all these ants and, and, and other um uh, insect parts and all the ants would be classified as wasps because they're only classified in the study as hymenopterans and hymenopterans include wasps and bees okay. but, but they're not really eating wasps and bees they're eating ants they're in the same order that makes sense interesting okay uh, Merlin, how long have you been working on your bat house guide, and what made you want to put this out right now? Well, there are a lot of well-intentioned people that go to a lot of work, either building or buying bat houses, and I hate seeing them fail and then uh, be uh, very down on on helping bats. Yeah. Uh, there are slews of people selling bat houses these days. That is good, but it's not good if you're selling cheaply made houses that bats don't like, or if you're selling good houses even without proper instruction. And mm -hmm. that's why we have begun providing certification for bat house uh, quality for vendors. And at the same time, I felt it was important to get out an updated publication where people could get the truth about bat needs without uh, whether the, owner, the vendor gives that information or not, you can get it now from the Bat House Guide. Yeah, I think. I think sometimes people are surprised at how big bat houses should be to be successful. I think they imagine a little almost birdhouse size thing showing up. Um, so I'm glad you have this information out. Here's what's interesting. Even the worst bat house ever made probably attracted bats somewhere at some time. Mm -hmm. If you're house gets blown away in a hurricane you'll go live in a cave if you have to to get shelter for a while but that doesn't mean you like caves <laughs> uh, so desperate bats like desperate people will live in strange places but uh, they don't voluntarily go to these marginal places and one way you test bat houses when i'm testing new design to see how well bats like it. I like to put it up and then give bats alternatives nearby okay. and uh, see if I can lure them to move out of the first house and into the alternative. If I can, then the alternative is obviously the better choice. Yeah. We've actually um, spoken quite a bit with Terry Lobdo, who has all of the bat houses around his property and all the different designs. Um, and I like to watch his videos monitoring where the bats like to be. And you definitely see they have preferences. <laughs> he was one of the uh, dozen or so most experienced bat house builders in America that we consulted for updating our guide. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And I really love that you have all the different species in here that could habitate a bat house. Um, some of these were quite a surprise to me. So I'll encourage people to check out the guide to see what kind of bats in their area could utilize a bat house. 
Um, is there anything else you'd like us to know about the bathhouse guide, Merlin, before we wrap up? Well, it's the best knowledge we have at this time. Knowledge improves steadily. I We've already made additional discoveries since writing that that I wish I had in it. But it is by far the most up-to-date information. And if you follow the instructions in that guide, you have a very good chance of success. I have some people in the comments saying they'd love to get the book. It is linked in Merlin's bio to get the Bat House Guide. You can, you can buy it almost anywhere where books are sold. Perfect. Thanks. I'm just making sure I didn't miss any questions that come through here. We have a lot of fans coming through from your recent Joe Rogan interview saying hello and hello to them i very much <laughs> enjoyed joe he does a great job uh catches a bit of flack occasionally for listening to all concern but i like that about him he's a very open-minded guy who pays attention to new things and some of them may be right and some wrong but he listens to everybody and he listened to me and we got along great i'm so glad to hear that uh, well, Merlin, I want to thank you so much for your time today, and I hope your power comes back soon and that you don't work too hard in the meantime stuck in the office. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Appreciate all you do for bats. Thank you. I hope to talk to you again soon, Merlin. Okay. Bye. Bye.